we had a theatre group called Brixton Fairies. And Brixton Fairies was a way of us expressing our, our lives through theatre. All those people were able to develop as individuals and as a community. It was 2015, we got this small grant from Tourism Island to create this float. You know, we were led by a group of original Sydney Queer Irish and then we had these, you know, eight lesbian leprechauns who were running all over the place. Panty Bliss was put on top of a, a rainbow and, you know, we had U2's song, Pride in the Name of Love, blaring. It was, it was incredible. The Bowman Society every year held a ball. It was like freedom when we get would go over there because we could be ourselves, we could um, dress for a, an entire weekend as women and be women for the weekend. And that, that was just incredible. In 1990, I came to San Francisco just for the summer as a field placement, working with homeless people living with AIDS. And that week, I also went to Mass at Most Holy Redeemer Parish in the Castro, the gay neighborhood. I've, and I found myself crying from the moment I walked in. I think I was in shorts and t-shirt. I wasn't ordained a deacon at the time. But I found myself crying because I realized this is the place where I can be myself and I can integrate and heal and, and, and be empowered here. Happy Pride and Broad Hona. Welcome to the launch of Out in the World, Ireland's LGBTQ plus diaspora. My name is Chris and I'm with Dublin Pride. I'm joined today by Maurice Casey, curator and researcher at EPIC, the Irish Immigration Museum, as well as Dr. Patrick Green, CEO and museum director, who will tell you a little bit more about the museum and the exhibition. Thank you, Christelle, and welcome everybody to the launch of Out in the World, a special exhibition being staged by EPIC, the Irish Emigration Museum. EPIC tells its stories, in fact over 300 of them, of people who have left Ireland and settled elsewhere in the world, sometimes never to return, sometimes to bring back their experiences with them. The particular focus of this exhibition is on LGBTQ plus activists. People have collaborated with this exhibition from all over the world and it's a tribute to my colleagues in the museum to, uh, and our many friends elsewhere that we've been able to stage this exhibition. We couldn't have happened without the Department of Foreign Affairs who have sponsored our historian in residence, Morris Casey. Please come and visit the exhibition, which we are launching now. We're very proud to do so during Dublin Pride. Come and visit the exhibition and visit EPIC. Thank you. Thanks so much, Patrick. And now on to the researcher, curator, and brain behind the exhibition, Morris Casey. Hi, everyone. It's my great privilege to welcome you here this evening to this virtual launch. How do we write a history of the Irish diaspora that restores to rightful prominence historically marginalized communities? That question has been at the center of my work here this past year as the Department of Foreign Affairs Historian Residence at EPIC, the Irish Emigration Museum. And I hope that this exhibition, Out in the World, Ireland's LGBTQ plus diaspora can be part of the answer. This exhibition arises from two ideas that are at the heart of my research. One, the idea that the history of Ireland's recent social transformation can be traced back through into the early 20th century and beyond. And two, that this history, when it is told, needs to include the emigrant experience. Emigrants inspired others at home by fighting for change abroad. Many emigrants would return home with models of community and activism that inspired the nation. The Irish government's recently released diaspora strategy has a very foresighted message about celebrating the diversity of the Irish diaspora. And I hope that this exhibition could be a further major celebration of a, of a hidden history and a vast and potentially limitless topic, that of Ireland's 
LGBTQ plus diaspora. And this uh, history can never be complete. And our six themes, exclusion, community, love, defiance, solidarity, and return have been chosen not to encapsulate an experience in its entirety, but simply to suggest significant aspects of the Irish LGBTQ plus diaspora experience. No work of research is ever solitary. We all build on the work of others. But throughout this exhibition, we have striven to collaborate with the LGBTQ plus community at every stage. I've learned so much over the past year from so many brilliant historians of sexuality and the diaspora, both here in Ireland and across the world. I've also learned so much from community groups, and in particular, from those featured in this exhibition and their family and their friends, who have truly underlined to me what it means to be part of a community. We want this exhibition to provide a platform for the Irish LGBTQ plus diaspora to share their stories, both through the exhibition programming, which we will organize throughout the exhibition, and through our story wall, which ex exists both here in person at the exhibition in CHQ building, where EPIC is located in Dublin, and also online. So I invite you all, members of the LGBTQ plus diaspora, to come visit us and share your story with us, or visit our website online and share your story there. We want to depict as complete a community portrait of this vast and vibrant diaspora experience as we can. And by sharing your story with us, you allow us to fulfill that role of both collaborating and continuing this collaboration with the community, but also ensuring that every single aspect and every important component of that community is represented as part of that exhibition. I look forward to welcoming those of you who've been to EPIC before back to the museum, and of course, welcoming first time visitors as well. I hope you enjoy the rest of our launch and thank you. For centuries, Irish identity has been shaped by immigration, by the lives and experience of our diaspora, who have always been as diverse as the Irish people themselves. However, that diversity has not always been recognised or appreciated as it is today, especially in the case of immigrants from the LGBTIQ community. The story of our LGBTIQ diaspora is part of a tale of repression and exile, but it's also a positive story of contribution, dedication and liberation. And above all, it's a story of an emotional connection of a community and love. Their courage helped to shape better societies, whether in Ireland, within our diaspora, or other communities around the world. And I want to pay tribute to EPIC, the Museum of Emigration, for their work in researching and narrating the hidden history of our LGBTIQ plus diaspora. I also want to pay tribute to the outstanding contributions by our LGBTIQ plus diaspora, which can only be briefly covered in this exhibition. The exhibition features 12 personal histories. However, EPIC researched 90 historical figures from the Irish diaspora, and no doubt could have done many, many more. The richness and complexity of that history better informs our understanding of Irish identity. I hope that for many who felt compelled to leave in order to live openly, that they feel their story and their experience are acknowledged here. In this Pride Month, this exhibition gives us all reason to be proud of our LGBTIQ plus diaspora and set out the new diaspora strategy which I launched with the Taoiseach last November. I want to reiterate our commitment to recognising their contribution and to working with them in future to strengthen their connection to Ireland. Part of this exhibition is an artwork installation about the LGBTQ plus diaspora experience. Here to tell us more is Irish designer and creator of this piece, Richard Malone. 
Hi there. <laughs> I'm Richard Malone and I am the designer and artist who's currently based in London, stuck in London because of the pandemic, but I've been commissioned to make a new body of work for the Out in the World exhibition. Um, it's so exciting for me to show in the kind of trajectory of all of the amazing radical queer voices who have fought for our rights and continue to create spaces for queer people and queer voices and I'm so excited and grateful to everyone on the exhibition team and all of the embassies who are going to host the show over the coming year or two. Um, I think it's such a bold show and such an honest show and um, my response to the commission was to try and center a very personal and a very vulnerable queer experience because I think more often than not in LGBTQIA plus or queer shows there's often a sort of heteronormative gaze and I think it's really important that we assert what it is to be queer in 2021 for ourselves and I'm really proud to be part of an exhibition that I think really celebrates all of the different voices and the different nuances that have become a part of our identities um, and I think it's a very human show and I think that that's that's really important to present that and to kind of celebrate how how radically Ireland has changed in my lifetime. Um, from everything from going home to vote with all of my peers and all of my friends and my family to watching us, you know, repeal the eighth and everyone come out and change, I guess, the fabric of what it is to be Irish and what it is to be an immigrant or an emigrant and how willing people are to fight for rights and how far we've come and I'm so honoured to have this body of work in a show with such incredible and radical human queer people who have amazing stories and um, amazing voices and who have constantly been creating spaces for us to make work whether that's creative work or activism and to thrive and I think that it's really important to have a show that presents queer people who are have created their own narrative and who continue to be radical and continue to self-define and show us in a light that is really respectful and human and vulnerable and honest um, and I'm thrilled to everyone, all of the curators, uh, everyone, I'm so grateful I guess to everyone who's been involved in giving me the space and helped us sort of change around the exhibition. It's changed a couple of times and now it's sort of more of a performance piece with written word and poems that are just I think kind of assertive of exactly where I am and how I am and what it means to me and also all of the questions that come with that so huge huge good luck to everyone I hope everyone goes and sees it and I hope that it's the beginning of our education system changing a little bit so that these people who are often isolated from conversations around activism or rights or human rights I hope they become a real part of the curriculum and they're a hugely important part to me and my peers and my community and I hope that um, people will continue to celebrate them and continue to promote these voices and teach how so many things can be changed and how they've been changed and celebrate the queer voices that continue to inspire and change our world at home and everywhere else. So thank you to everyone. I can't wait to see the show in person. Probably be a while but um, I'm super happy and I hope you enjoy it. So. Thanks from London, Guramila Mahagat, and see you there at some point. Bye. I'm delighted now to welcome Rory O'Neill, a returned immigrant, a Pride ambassador, and a gay rights activist who will launch this exhibition. Hi, I am really delighted to be asked to launch the Out in the World exhibition here at Epic because um, for starters, I think very often the contribution that um, Irish immigrants made to the Ireland's uh, a, you know, a LGBTI equality a story is underplayed or not recognised enough. And not just the obvious uh, contribution they made in uh, LGBTIQ uh, people themselves leaving the country and, and coming back and sort of energising the story here, but also um, the contribution that straight Irish people made when they left this country and had their horizons broadened, uh, maybe moved to countries where the uh, LGBTI equality story was further advanced, um, and then came back with a new view on these things. Um, 
But also I'm delighted to be asked to launch it because I, like so many other Irish people, have my own immigration story and it's entirely bound up with my identity as both an Irish person and as a member of the LGBTI community. Um, you know, I left Ireland in 1990, um, just after I finished college, and I left, um, I didn't so much leave as I ran out of this country, because at that time, I strongly felt that I would never be able to make a home here. I never felt that the concept of Irishness was elastic enough to stretch around someone like me. I mean, 1990, that was three years before decriminalization. Um, and it was a time when, you know, Ireland was, uh, I would say, aggressively <laughs> heterosexual. Um, you know, there were no queer people on television, on the radio. There was no queer people in my life. Um, and, you know, and as a college student, just finding other queer people um, had been a real struggle. Um, it was a difficult thing to do, just to find another person like you. Um, so I had run out of this country. While I was away, the great changes that, you know, have come to fruition over the years started to happen in my absence, in a way. You know, I was living in Tokyo in 1993 when decriminalization happened. So I was, like, reading about these things in the newspaper. Again, before the Internet, so there was no email, and, you know, telephone calls even were expensive and prohibitive. So I was really at a far removed from all of that. Um, and so it came as a sort of a surprise to me la years later when I returned to Ireland at the time, thinking I was only visiting, to sort of see the changes that were happening. And for the first time, and that was sort of 1995, to start to think that maybe I could make a place for myself in this country. Um, the feeling that actually the definition of Irishness was becoming more elastic and um, was able to stretch around someone like me. Um, and for me, I, I always think of this one particular time. It was um, St. Patrick's Day in Tokyo in 93 or 4, I'm guessing. And uh, it was the first time that St. Patrick's Day was being celebrated in any way in Tokyo. But some members of the Irish community there had decided they were going to put on a little parade. And, so I was aware of that something was happening. And at that time, I was working in this giant nightclub and where I would you know, get paid to run around being a fool for the night and drag. And on that night, I went to work. And while I was living in Tokyo, I had no interest in meeting other Irish people because I still carried with me the feeling that I had that I le when I left, that Ireland had rejected me or was pushing me out. And Meeting other Irish people was really just a reminder of that, and it wasn't something I wanted to be reminded of. Um, and I turned up for work that night, and the boss, and you know, this is a gigantic nightclub spread over seven floors in an industrial building, and the boss says to me, he says, Ah, Panty, there are a group of people coming from Iceland tonight celebrating King Patrick. And... I was filled with a sort of horror because I didn't want to meet any Irish people. And so I ran around the whole nightclub telling every staff member, if you meet the other people from Iceland, um, do not tell them that I'm also from Iceland. Um, and when I think of that now, it seems like another world. Because Ireland has changed so much that the idea now that I would have been, you know, almost afraid to meet other Irish people. It seems so crazy to me now. But that is how dramatic and transformative the journey that Ireland has taken has been. Um, and it has been especially transformative, obviously, for someone like me, a member of the LGBTI community. So I have a lot of feelings looking at this um, really great exhibition. Um, so many of the things in it um, strike a chord with me. Um, the feeling of being excluded from the country that you were born into at one time that drove you away. Um, the sense of change that has happened in this country and the much more welcoming place that it is now for people like me. And um, finally, I wanted to tell you one other thing. You know, um, there's this documentary movie um, ostensibly about me, but really about Ireland's um, story called The Queen of Ireland. And when it was sort of released into the world and went out 
Um, and when it gets shown in other countries, and in particular the US, the UK, or Australia, it gets seen by a lot of members of the you know, LGBTI Irish diaspora. And in the movie, my parents feature quite heavily, and you know, my mother's a lovely, warm woman. And after the movie was released, my mother started to get letters. And the letters are from older Irish queer people, mostly gay men, who saw the movie, and they are living in Australia or the US or even just the UK or, and in other places. And they, like me, felt that they were driven out of this country back in the 70s or 80s. But unlike me, these men never returned. And they never felt comfortable coming back. And they also never explained to their own mother why they had left and why they never returned. And they never came out to the, their mothers. And now it's too late for them. And their mothers have passed on. And so in this weird but beautiful thing, they then sit down and write letters to my mother in Ballinrobe, County Mayo, writing to her as a sort of proxy or substitute for their own mother and telling my mother their story. And it is both awfully sad, but also exquisitely beautiful that now they feel they can tell their story and they've chosen to tell it to my mother. And my mother is a very good mammy who always writes thank you notes and replies to everything. So she writes back to them. And it, to me, that sums up the story of Ireland's LGBTI expatriate community because it is both crushingly sad and beautifully hopeful. So, I'm absolutely delighted <laughs> to be asked to launch this exhibition, and I encourage you all to come and see it, and it's well worth it. Thanks so much, Roy, for sharing your story with us. It's really great not only to feature a returned emigrant as part of our launch this evening, but also someone who's such a fantastic champion and advocate for the LGBTQ plus community here in Ireland. Earlier, I spoke with Paul O'Dwyer, Paul was a founding member of the Irish Lesbian and Gay Organization in New York in 1990, as well as being a member of ACT UP New York. He's currently a New York-based immigration attorney. Paul, uh, thanks so much for joining us for the launch of Out in the World. So I wondered if you could just outline for us your immigration story. So I am originally from Kilkenny and I went to university in Galway in the early to mid 80s. Uh, and then I went to university in Dublin for two years. And then I came here in 1987 and uh, without any actual intention of staying here long-term, I know I'm staying here permanently um, and I'm still here. You were one of the founding members of the Irish Lesbian and Gay Organization in New York City when it was established in yeah. 1990. And I wanted to talk in particular about that story. And I wondered if you could just tell everyone what led to ILGO, or ILGO as uh, many call it, becoming recognized around the world for its campaign for Irish LGBTQ plus inclusion or Irish LGBTQ plus people to be included as part of the official Fifth Avenue, New York City, St. Patrick's Day Parade. Yeah, so, so I think it is, so I think why, why we got such media attention and why it became such a, you know, at, at the time almost, I should say, like a worldwide thing, uh, is, is not so much because of our attempt to, or our, you know, demand to be allowed to participate, but it was really the opposition to it, I think, that kind of suddenly sparked people's interest and awareness and maybe made people aware of things that they had not been aware of before, just like the level of homophobia that, that existed. Um, and ironically, that existed of all places in New York City. 
uh, and by contrast, which kind of didn't seem to be existing in other places. And so what had happened, just by way of background, we we had, um, you know, it was a small kind of loosely organized group of people, and we decided that we would apply to March and St. Patrick's Day Parade without without really thinking much about it. Um, we certainly weren't doing it as a, really we weren't anticipating what the response was going to be, but we just kind of did it kind of really without thinking much about it one way or another. And, um, and then it was, they refused it, our application, um, and then we challenged it, and then the almost sudden, like almost overnight, it turned into kind of a media maelstrom. We had, um, you know, we had filed a complaint against the parade organizers with the City Human Rights Commission, um, and uh, and that, of course, got various levels of city government involved. And then uh, all of a sudden the media got involved and and in a way it sort of played out as a sort of not not just the I think part of what what made it so interesting from a media perspective was that it was a sense of like these are the new Irish people here in New York and those people who won't let them march are the old Irish people the old guard of the Irish people in New York and um, and, and it was surprising because it was almost all of the people in the parade organizers who refused to let us march were Irish. They were not Irish American. Um, and, and, of course, and we were predominantly all Irish as well. Um, and we had our first black mayor, David Jenkins, who was not popular with a lot of uh, the Irish American and the Irish community here, largely because he was black, um, and a lot of his administration were black, um, and African American and people of color, and uh, that was sort of not necessarily what a lot of Irish people had wanted to see. And he was very involved and supportive of our attempts to be involved, and he, in, you know, in order to allow us march the first year where, we, where they refused to let us march, um, he insisted that that he would march and we would march with him. Um, and and along with one one particularly progressive division of, of the or, the organizers, and so we marched. Then it was, um, you know, I mean, it was it was insane that like the amount we just like. Um, we walked fairly fast because people were throwing things at us, people were screaming tirades of abuse at us, like the whole way. But I think the legacy of the campaign also, in a certain way, it was successful from, from that very, very first year. Because what it did uh, was it made the New York City St. Patrick's Day Parade synonymous with LGBT rights. Um, and, and the longer they said you can't march, the more the St. Patrick's Day Parade became associated with LGBT rights. So we marched, I marched in the parade in Boston, either in 1992 or 1993, I can't remember which year it was. And I have to say as bad as the parade in New York was, the parade in Boston was just completely horrifying. Um, it was uh, it, through a neighborhood uh, and, and rather than in New York where it's kind of through part of like Midtown Manhattan, which is really just all office buildings. The one in Boston is through a neighborhood and like through streets with people's houses on either side. And you know, people had camped out in their front garden with, you know, missiles to throw at us. Uh, not like, like with like cans of beer, big pizza, stones, whatever else. Uh, there were, the Boston police were terrified. They had anti-sniper police on rooftops in case someone tried to kill us. Um, and, and I think that, Again, to kind of hop back a little bit to what I was saying earlier, I think that kind of really woke people up to how, to like, this is the reality of what gay people sometimes face. Thanks, Paul. I was wondering then, as a final question, whether you could speak to how and whether um, the Irish diaspora has become a more inclusive place and your sense of how Ireland has become a more inclusive place for LGBTQ plus people. So, 
to answer you the second part of your question first, I think the certainly Ireland has become a more welcoming place. Um, and then, you know, for LGBT people, but also it's become a much more diverse place generally. Uh, so I don't think that issue, I don't think that it's become kind of progressive on LGBT issues in a vacuum. Um, I think the country has changed kind of dramatically, certainly since when I left. Um, and yeah, so I do think, and of course, you know, we've had, you know, um, openly gay politicians. Um, it's, it's kind of like a nondescript feature of day-to-day -day life in Ireland. Um, and so for sure, Ireland has changed in that regard. The Irish diaspora, I think, has changed also, um, but I think it has just changed in the way that the world has changed. Um, thanks, Paul. Thanks for the detail uh, and the uh, thanks for your answers. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Vanessa Monaghan, Chair of the London Irish LGBT Network. Greetings from London. I'm proud and delighted to have been asked to be a voice for the Irish LGBTQ diaspora today. My name is Vanessa Monaghan and I'm the chair of the London Irish LGBT Network and I also present the London Ear. It's a community-based radio show that's recorded here in London every week and it's broadcast on RTE 2XM every Saturday at one o'clock. The LGBTQ community hasn't always had the best relationship with Ireland, which is why so many emigrated to be truly themselves. Recently, the LGBT network actually hosted an event in conjunction with the Irish Embassy here in London. It was entitled Rainbow Crossings and it looked at the lives of LGBTQ people who came to the UK, came to London, during the 70s and 80s. And it was truly fascinating how impactful their presence was on LGBTQ politics and history now. So that's why it's really, really important that these stories are documented and that's why it's really important that we have this exhibition. I'm living in London for about seven years now and I was one of the lucky ones who was still eligible to go home to vote for marriage equality. I remember the buzz that morning myself and my partner getting up and leaving on the early train to get our plane from Gatwick to Dublin and arriving in Dublin and the mood was just one of love and optimism. But for many people it was about more than just voting for equal marriage. It was voting to ensure that we were validated and that we knew we belonged. I became chair of the London Irish LGBT Network just over a year ago at the start of the pandemic, which was quite daunting really, as we didn't know what was happening. We didn't know what the future for anything was, and we weren't sure of what direction we should take. So we started doing some online meetups and that has opened, literally opened the world to us. We've made friends and connections from all over the world and it has been fantastic in getting to know these new people that we never ordinarily would have met. We're really looking forward to being able to build these communities and relationships even more and maybe even, you never know, being able to meet up in person. When all is said and done, Ireland's still our home. We're still very proud to be part of the LGBTQ community and we're still extremely proud to be Irish. We're really looking forward to seeing the exhibition, even if it means that we can't see it right now in Dublin. We're really looking forward to hopefully seeing it here in London in the future. Thank you to everyone at Epic, especially Morris Casey, who has been such a fantastic champion of the LGBTQ community. We're truly, truly grateful for all the work you've done on this project out in the world. I just can't wait to see it. Best of luck with the exhibition. Gurmila Mothet. As you will have heard earlier, this exhibition is just the start of a conversation. Morris, how can people take part? You can take part in our exhibition out in the world by sharing your story with us. You can do so in two ways. You can, for example, visit our website outintheworld.ie and share your story there. Or you can come down to our ex exhibition here in person and write up your story and place it on our story wall. We're interested in hearing from everyone, both the LGBTQ plus community, family and allies. If you have a story of LGBTQ plus emigration that you're um, able and willing to share, we'd love to hear from you. We've already heard one great example tonight, Rory O'Neill, who shared with us, with us his story of leaving Ireland for Japan. We want to know things like where you left, or where you left from, 
why you left, when you left. What was the community like when you arrived? Were they welcoming? Were they not? And how has Ireland changed since you've been away? Did you return? And why did you return? All these questions and more are the kind of things that will really help us encapsulate this vast experience and, and uh, really tell the story in a way that represents the entire spectrum of the community. So I really appreciate all of those who come in here or go to our website and submit their story. On that note of gratitude, I would like to deliver some thank yous to everyone who's made this exhibition possible. And it's a truly vast community of people who have done so. On behalf of myself and of Epic, our greatest thanks must go to the people who shared their stories with us that are featured on our 12 stories here at the exhibition. Not just those people who are featured, but also in many cases, friends and family who shared with us documents, photos and memories of their loved ones. I must also thank the amazing community of scholars and academics who I've been touched with throughout this year. It's by no means easy to research a global history and a pandemic, but groups such as Queer Culture Ireland and my own um, academic network have been enormously important in linking me into archives and different community groups. The Government of Ireland um, Emigrant Support Programme made this exhibition possible through its generous support. Under the Department of Foreign Affairs, diplomats, consulates, embassies have been enormously important in sharing with us LGBTQ plus stories from the communities they serve. So I'd particularly like to thank everyone at the DFA and the Irish Abroad Unit. Thanks must go to a number of people whose presence is felt on the whole um, physical nature of this exhibition and the site as well. People like Joanne Byrne, Yvonne Murphy, Peter Whitaker, and the teams at DMW Creative, Verb Web Design, Max Media, Stream Fox, We The People, and The Public House. All these teams have been enormously helpful both in putting the exhibition together and now helping us launch it today. I, of course, want to thank the team at Epic. There's been so many people in, involved. Every single team at Epic has been working on this exhibition and helping us launch it. But I particularly like to give a shout out to the person who appears in my Zoom window every morning, Nathan Mannion, our senior creator here, who for me has been personally just a, a brilliant guide through this process, the first time I ever translated my research into an exhibition. So thank you, Nathan. Finally, I want to thank all of you at home for tuning in, for spending your evening with us and learning more about Ireland's LGBTQ plus diaspora. I hope that you find a chance to visit the exhibition soon. Of course, my final thanks must go to the LGBTQ plus community, whose past and present provides a model for us all. Thank you. Thanks so much, Maurice. And that's it from us folks. I hope you enjoyed the launch of Out in the World, Ireland's LGBTQ plus diaspora. Our theme for Dublin Pride 2021 is community, and we really want to come together and support the LGBTQ community in the country. So we're asking you to donate to our Dublin Pride Community Fund at the Community Foundation for Ireland. You can donate to the fund at www.dublinpride.ie forward slash donate, and all proceeds will go directly towards supporting LGBTQ communities, services, and organizations in the country affected by the COVID-19 crisis. But enough about us. We've teamed up with other museums, Molly, the National Library, and the Little Museum of Dublin. So make sure to check them out. Thanks so much again to Epic and also to CHQ for hosting us today. And I wish you all a happy Pride and broad honour. <laughs>